Lecture 7 On the Three Pillars Wisdom, Strength, and Beauty When Orient Wisdom beamed serene and pillared strength arose, when beauty tinged the glowing scene and faith her mansion chose, exulting bands the fabric viewed, mysterious powers adored, and high the triple union stood that gave the mystic word. Stanfield The emblematical foundation of a mason's lodge is wisdom, strength, and beauty. These three noble pillars give it a stability which no exertion of art or ingenuity can subvert, no force can overthrow. They were thus named in allusion to the perfection with which our system has been endowed by the almighty architect, because without wisdom to contrive, strength to support, and beauty to adorn, no structure can be perfect. And this is illustrated by a reference to the most splendid and awful images which can be presented to the human mind. The universe is the temple of the deity whom we serve. Wisdom, strength, and beauty are about his throne as pillars of his work. For his wisdom is infinite, his strength is omnipotence, and his beauty shines forth through all his creation in symmetry and order. He hath stretched forth the heavens as a canopy, the earth he hath planted as his footstool. He hath crowned this superb temple with stars as with a diadem, and in his hand he extendeth the power and the glory. The sun and moon are messengers of his will, and all his laws are conquered. This universal harmony of nature and nature's works, emblematical of the peace and unity which subsist in a mason's lodge, is produced from the union of those sublime qualities by which our fabric is supported, wisdom, strength, and beauty. The first pillars used by the primitive inhabitants of the earth were merely trunks of trees, placed upright on stones to elevate them above the damp and covered at the top with a flat stone to keep off the rain. On these, the roofs of their huts were placed, covered with reeds and plastered with clay to resist the effects of tempestuous weather. From such simple elements sprang the noble orders of architecture. But pillars were not confined to this use alone. In primitive times, they were appropriated to the purpose of perpetuating remarkable events and were erected as monuments of gratitude to divine providence for favors conferred or for dangers avoided. By the idolatrous race who first seceded from the true worship of God, pillars were dedicated to the host of heaven. Of this nature were the pillars set up by the Hypsoranios and Usus to fire and air before the flood. Osiris set up pillars in commemoration of his conquest on which were hieroglyphical inscriptions, importing the degree of resistance made by the inhabitants of those countries which he subdued. The ancient kings of Egypt followed this example and usually engraved records of their conquest, power, and magnificence on obelisks or pillars. Sesostris, in his military progress through the nations he had vanquished, erected pillars on which hieroglyphical inscriptions were engraven, accompanied by certain emblematical devices expressive of the bravery or pusillanimity of the conquered people. And if Proclus may be believed, all extraordinary events, singular transactions, and new inventions were recorded by the Egyptians on stone pillars. Hiram, king of Tyre, according to Menander, dedicated a pillar of gold to Jupiter on the grand junction he had formed between Eurochorus and Tyre. This custom was also in use amongst the descendants of Seth and Shem, who erected pillars to the honor of the true God, the creator and preserver of all things. Enoch erected two pillars in order to transmit his knowledge to posterity by inscriptions engraven on such materials as were calculated to resist the element by which the world was to be destroyed. The pillar of Jacob at Bethel was constructed to commemorate his most extraordinary vision and covenant with God. 
On this pillar he poured oil, whence arose the custom amongst the heathens of consecrating their idols by anointing them with oil. A similar monument was erected by the same patriarch at Galid to perpetuate the Treaty of Amity with his uncle Laban, by Joshua at Gilgal on his miraculous passage over the river Jordan, and by Samuel between Mizpah and Shen on a remarkable defeat of the Philistines. Absalom erected a pillar in honor of himself, which, as we are told by modern travelers, remains to this day. But Dr. Lloyd says that the passers-by throw stones at it in detestation of his memory. And Solomon set up two pillars at the entrance of the porch of the temple to remind the Jews of their dependence upon God for everything they possessed, evidenced by their escape from Egypt and their miraculous wandering and preservation in the wilderness for a period of 40 years. It is needless to add that commemorative columns were used by every nation of the world, and never with more propriety and effect than in our own country at the present day. The particular pillars which are the subject of this lecture are emblematical of the three great Masonic characters, whose united abilities rendered an essential service to true religion. By the construction of a primitive temple, then first dedicated to the exclusive purpose of religious worship, for they jointly possessed the essential properties which characterize the three great sustaining pillars of our lodge, the one had wisdom to contrive, another had strength to support, and the third possessed genius and ability to adorn the edifice with unexampled beauty. The result of this union was a building which highly transcended all that we are capable to imagine and has ever been esteemed, the finest piece of masonry upon earth before or since. This magnificent work was begun in Mount Moriah on Monday, the second day of the month Ziph, which answers to the 21st of our April, being the second month of the sacred year, and was carried on with such speed that it was finished in all its parts in a little more than seven years, which happened on the eighth day of the month Buell, which answers to the 23rd of our October, being the seventh month of the sacred year, and the eleventh of King Solomon. What is still more astonishing is that every piece of it, whether timber, stone, or metal, was brought ready cut, framed, and polished to Jerusalem, so that no other tools were wanted nor heard than what were necessary to join the several parts together. All the noise of axe, hammer, and saw was confined to Lebanon, and the quarries and plains of Zeradatha, that nothing might be heard among the masons of Zion save harmony and peace. These pillars refer further to the three governors of the lodge. The pillar of wisdom represents the W.M., whose business is to exert his judgment and penetration in contriving the most proper and efficient means of completing the intended work, of what nature soever it may be. The pillar of strength refers to the S.W., whose duty is to support the authority and facilitate the designs of the master with all his influence amongst the brethren, and to see that his commands are carried into full and permanent effect. The pillar of beauty is the J.W., whose duty it is to adorn the work with all his powers of genius and active industry, to promote regularity amongst the brethren by the sanction of his own good example, the persuasive eloquence of precept, and a discriminative encouragement of merit. Thus, by the united energies of these three presiding officers, the system is adorned and established firm as a rock in the midst of the ocean, braving the malignant shafts of envy and detraction, its summit gilded with the rays of the meridian sun, though stormy winds and waves beat eternally on its basis. In the British and other mysteries, these three pillars represented the great emblematical triad of deity. As with us, they refer to the three principal officers of the lodge. We shall find, however, that the symbolical meaning was the same in both.
it is a fact that in Britain, the Aditum or Lodge was actually supported by three stones or pillars, which were supposed to convey a regenerating purity to the aspirant after having endured the ceremony of initiation in all its accustomed formalities. The delivery from between them was termed a new birth. The corresponding pillars of the Hindu mythology were also known by the names of wisdom, strength, and beauty, and placed in the east, west, and south, crowned with three human heads. They jointly referred to the creator who was said to have planned the great work by his infinite wisdom, executed by his strength, and to have adorned it with all its beauty and usefulness for the benefit of man. These united powers were not overlooked in the mysteries, for we find them represented in the solemn ceremony of initiation by the three presiding Brahmins or Hierophants. The chief Brahmin sat in the east, high exalted on a brilliant throne, clad in a flowing robe of azure, thickly sparkled with golden stars and bearing in his hand a magical rod, thus symbolizing Brahma, the creator of the world. His two compeers, clad in robes of equal magnificence, occupied corresponding situations of distinction. The representative of Vishnu, the setting sun, was placed on an exalted throne in the west, and he who personated Siva, the meridian sun, occupied a splendid throne in the south. The Masonic Lodge, bounded only by the extreme points of the compass, the highest heavens, and the lowest depth of the central abyss is said to be supported by three pillars, wisdom, strength, and beauty. In like manner, the Persians, who termed their emblematical Mithratic cave or lodge, the Empyrean, feigned it to be supported by three intelligences, or Mista, Mithra, and Mithras, who were usually denominated from certain characteristics which they were supposed individually to possess, eternity, fecundity, and authority. Similar to this were the forms of the Egyptian deity, designated by the attributes of wisdom, power, and goodness, and the sovereign good, intellect, and energy of the Platonist, which were also regarded as the respective properties of the divine triad. It is remarkable that every mysterious system practiced on the habitable globe contained this triad of deity, which some writers refer to the Trinity, and others to the triple offspring of Noah. The oracle in Damascus asserts that throughout the world a triad shines forth, which resolves itself into a monad, and the uniform symbol of this threefold deity was an equilateral triangle the precise form occupied by our pillars of wisdom, strength, and beauty. In the mysteries of India, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva were considered as a triune god, distinguished by the significant appellation of Trimurti. Brahma was said to be the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the judge or destroyer. In the east, as the pillar of wisdom, this deity was called Brahma, in the west as the pillar of strength, Vishnu, and in the south as the pillar of beauty, Shiva, and hence in the Indian initiations, as we have just observed, the representative of Brahma was seated in the east, that of Vishnu in the west, and that of Shiva in the south, a very remarkable coincidence with the practice of ancient masonry. Mr. Faber offers the following reasonable conjecture on the origin of these idolatrous triads. Adam was born from the virgin earth. Noah was produced from his allegorical mother, the ark, without the cooperation of a father. Each was a preacher of righteousness. Each dwelt upon the paradisiacal mount of God. Each was a universal parent. If Adam introduced one world, Noah destroyed that world and introduced another, and, as the actual circumstance of two successive worlds led to the doctrine of an endless mundane succession, each patriarch was alike received as a creator, a preserver, and a destroyer. 
Sir William Jones very strongly reprobates the principle which would resolve these triads into the doctrine of the Trinity. In his essay on the gods of Italy, Greece, and India, he says, Very respectable natives have assured me that one or two missionaries have been absurd enough in their zeal for the conversion of the Gentiles to urge that the Hindus were even now almost Christians because their Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva were no other than the Christian trinity, a sentence in which we can only doubt whether folly, ignorance, or impiety predominates. The three powers, creative, preservative, and destructive, which the Hindus express by the triliteral word Am, were grossly ascribed by the first idolaters to the heat, light, and flame of their mistaken divinity, the sun and their wiser successors in the East, who perceived that the sun was only a created thing, applied those powers to its creator. But the Indian triad, and that of Plato, which he calls the supreme good, the reason, and the soul, are infinitely removed from the holiness and sublimity of the doctrine which pious Christians have deduced from text in the gospel. In another point of view, says Captain Wilford, Brahma corresponds with the Kronos or time of the Greek mythologist. Vishnu represents water or the humid principle and Iswara, another name of Shiva, fire, which recreates or destroys as it is differently employed. It seems not altogether improbable, however, but these triads, which are quaintly termed by purchase and apish imitation of the trinity brought in by the devil might originate from a tradition of the holy trinity revealed to adam and propagated by his descendants through the antediluvian world known consequently to noah and his family this doctrine would spread with every migration of their posterity and as it certainly formed a part of that original system which is now termed masonry so it was introduced into every perversion of that system until the doctrine of a divine triad resolvable into a monad was universally disseminated in every nation and was admitted by every people in the world in successive ages the true purport became lost or misunderstood but the principle remained though its application ceased to be made to the true god and father of all and was generally transferred to the three sons of Noah as a triplication of the mortal father of the human race. The Grecian triad consisted of Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, the Orphic of Phanes, Uranus, and Cronus, the Platonic of Tagathon, Nous, Psyche, the Eleusinian of Bacchus, Proserpine, Ceres, the Egyptian of Trismegistus or Osiris, Isis, Horus, perhaps of Aikton, Neph, Ptah, the Persian of the Triplasian Mithras or Ormsida, Mithra, and Mithras, the Phoenician of Ashtaroth, Milcom, Chemosh, the Tyrian of Belus, Venus, Tammuz, the Celtic of Hu, Seridwin, Krilwi, the Gothic of Woden, Frigga, Thor, the Peruvian of Tanga Tanga, or three in one and one in three, and the Mexican of Vitz, Lipultsli, Tlaloc, Tezcalapuca. In our own country, the triad was usually represented by three pillars, and many monuments remain which show to what an extent this system of devotion was carried by the British Druids. These pillars were not always uniform, either in dimensions or situation, but were differently placed, either triangularly or in a right line, and were certainly objects of adoration to the superstitious natives. The celebrated pillars at Borough Bridge were of this nature. They consist of three colossal upright stones placed at about 200 feet distant from each other 
and stand about 22 feet above the surface of the ground, measuring on average 16 feet in circumference. They are termed by the country people the Devil's Arrows, which corroborates the opinion that they were British deities, for it is a singular fact that every monument which has this name attached to it is supposed to have been peculiarly sacred. Leland tells us that there were originally four pillars and that one of them has been destroyed. This might have been of still more extensive magnitude and designed to express the triad completed in a monad. The three stones which formed one of the Aditya in the stupendous Druid temple at Albury in Wiltshire, said by Gao and Camden, to have served for a chapel, are called by Aubrey the Devil's Quoits. A kissed Vienne in Clatford Bottom in the same country is also composed of three upright stones and is called the Devil's Den. In the parish of Land Re Drus, in that grand depository of Druidical superstition, Anglesey, are the remains of this species of idol. Gibson and Camden informs us that they are placed triangularly, one is 11 feet and the others 10 and 9 feet in height. On a mountain near Kilyamin Ild in Kermarchenshire is another specimen of this kind of monument placed near a circular temple. In Penrith Churchyard in the county of Cumberland still remain three pillars placed triangularly and erected on other stones to avoid the supposed contamination of the earth. Two of them are about 12 feet and the third about 6 feet in height. The two former enclose a space of ground which is traditionally denominated the giant's grave and the latter is the giant's thumb. Now the British deities were all esteemed giants and the tradition in this instance corresponds with the fact. Besides the pastos or symbolical grave in which the candidate suffered a mythological interment was said to be guarded by the gigantic deity Buanwer. And if these three pillars formed constituent parts of an editum, which is highly probable, the name it now retains is perfectly consistent with the pure principles of British mythology. Much has been written on the subject of these pillars by all our best antiquaries, who seem to agree that they were of British erection, though they puzzled to account for their being inscribed with a cross. But this doubtless arose from the anxiety uniformly displayed by the first Christian missionaries to transfer the devotional attachment of the natives from a lifeless image to the eternal God by assuming the great emblem of Christianity, which had indeed been previously used by the Druids, but with a different illusion. And this conjecture is strikingly exemplified by the fact that a Christian church was erected within the actual bounds of this sanctuary of idolatry. Such were the representatives of Hu, Seridwin, Krewi, the principal deities of the ancient inhabitants of this island, or their substitutes, the three presiding officers of the British mysteries, who were denominated Kerdiriath, Garonwi, and Flairdwer Flam, seated in the east, west, and south. Before these senseless blocks of unhewn stone, the more senseless inhabitants of Britain prostrated themselves daily in humble adoration, firmly persuaded that their prosperity in every undertaking, nay, even the preservation of their lives and liberties, was dependent on the beneficent agency of these shapeless idols. I shall conclude the present lecture with a brief consideration of the ultimate reference which the three Masonic pillars bear to your moral and religious duties. As the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian orders of architecture are said to support your large, so let your conduct be governed by the qualities they represent. Let wisdom guide your steps to that fountain of knowledge and source of truth, the Holy Bible. 
There shall you find rules for the government of your actions and the path that leads to eternity. Even the science you profess instructs you that if you be conversant in the doctrines of this holy book and strictly adherent to its precepts, it will conduct you to a building not made with hands, eternally in the heavens. Proceed in this career, armed with the strength of faith and hope, assured that if your faith in the deity be securely founded, your constancy can never fail. So shall your charity shine forth in all the beauty of holiness. Your acts of piety and virtue shall emit a brilliancy like the sun, pursuing his daily course in the heavens, and finally secure you a place in the grand lodge above, where peace, order, and harmony eternally abide.